So we've been uh, doing this seemingly endless series on prayer. But uh, I'll tell you what, Spurgeon said one time, you have to beat this stuff into your people's heads. <laughs> now, he, he was one of the greatest preachers of the church age and um, had great revival and outpouring of the spirit in the 1850s in England. And yet he lamented the fact that many times and most of the time when you preach as a preacher, even if you pray and do all you're supposed to do, that's, uh, so there's always a measure of it that just doesn't get through. It just bounces off. And um, uh, the subject of prayer is the most challenging of all subjects because the devil hates prayer. He hates God's word, but he also hates prayer because he hates our fellowship with the Lord. And prayer is our way of speaking to God and sharing our feelings with him and pouring out our hearts to him and making our requests to him. That's what prayer's about. Prayer is to ask and receive, to, to get God to work. He has set it up that way so he can build our faith, bless us, show us he loves us, and let us partake in his purposes and his program through prayer. And we've been saying that when we don't pray, when we go for days, hours, whatever, and don't pray, then we miss something very important as a believer. Our fellowship with the Father, with His Son, goes two ways. That's why we love the Word of God, and we encourage you to read the Word of God at least a little bit every day so you hear from the Lord. He can speak to your heart beyond understanding. You might say, well, I don't get this. I don't understand it all. It's, it's, it's like eating. You don't understand all the laws of digestion, but it keeps you alive and strengthens you. And that's the way the Word of God is sometimes. Sometimes you see it. It's beautiful. Makes you feel good. Other times it's almost like drudgery. I'm reading it because I'm supposed to. But we do it like we eat. We don't always like everything we eat, but we eat. And we feed our hearts. And when we do gives God an opportunity to speak to our hearts, in our hearts. And he, when he speaks, there's power. He spoke the creation into existence. The word of God is powerful. So we need to expose ourselves to it. But prayer is so important because it's the other end. He speaks to us in his word. We speak to him through prayer. So we have reached this point now where we're going to look at Daniel chapter 9. And in Daniel chapter 9, we have this incredible, beautiful, powerful prayer that Daniel prayed to the Father when he read Jeremiah and found out that as he was reading, it was 68 years since Jeremiah predicted that after 70 years, Israel would be able to go back to its land from which it had been scattered by Nebuchadnezzar, go back to Jerusalem, rebuild the walls, rebuild the temple, reestablish God's purpose on earth to prepare for the coming of the Messiah. And that is so evident because in chapter 9, if you will read it, and I hope you will, after his prayer, an angel comes to him and gives him specifics about the coming of the Messiah. So specific. It even says the Messiah will be cut off. And you know the Jews never could believe that. And they still don't accept the crucifixion of Christ as if he's the Messiah. Many of them, many do. But the point is, it was revealed clearly after his prayer. This prayer was to reinstate Israel in the purpose of God to bring his salvation to the earth. This is a big deal. And Daniel, here this old, old man who'd been maybe 70 years, 80 years in so-called captivity, but of course he rose to the top in every empire and God just blessed him and used him mightily to bring people to God, to the true God, and, and used him in power to, to uh, bring kings to God. So uh, Daniel there was a faithful prayer warrior and this prayer 
just fits his spirit and his personality. And he cries out to God. Now we're going to begin today to look at it. I've picked out seven specifics that I believe are very important, things uh, that Daniel prayed for. And of course, we won't get through them all today, but they're worth waiting for. They're worth looking at because if there is a mighty lesson in how to get something from God, to get God to do something. And you may not be praying for some big historic event, but you can pray for the smallest details of your own life. And God wants to minister to you right where you are and bless you in answer to prayer in your little world. And his way of building faith is to answer your prayers, but he can't answer them if you don't ask him. We have not because we ask not. Okay, so the first thing we saw about this prayer was that Daniel uses two phrases to describe God and they're Hebrew phrases. And one means the God who is self-existent, the God who is all powerful, the God who created everything and the God who sustains everything. And not only that, but the God who is the judge of the earth. He has, has to be the judge of the earth. We need a judge because we need justice. Without justice, nothing works. Nothing works. We know how awful it is when we are victims of injustice or unjustice. So we know justice is just righteousness. Justice, justice is just doing what's right. And God upholds justice and he punishes evil because evil destroys justice. It destroys his creation. It destroys his people. So God in love and mercy and grace, which is the second phrase, the second phrase that he uses describing Daniel gives us the balance. While he is the judge of all the earth and he upholds righteousness, he is a God who's full of mercy, full of hesed as the Old Testament calls it, uh, steadfast love that never changes, everlasting love. He's full of mercy and grace and he would much rather forgive than punish. But we drive him to it. He'd rather forgive than chastise us but we drive him to it. And we need to just see that, that he is waiting and longing to pour out his goodness and his love and his mercy. And that should drive us, motivate us to wanna to be what we ought to be in his sight, to draw on his power through prayer and his word and live so he can bless us. And then not only is that good for us, but it's good for all those around us. Just like Daniel's influence affected everybody around him so we can be exactly the same in our little world. So don't uh, undersell uh, your power and blessing through prayer to the Lord as a little individual here on the backside of nowhere in uh, God's kingdom. Okay, so two, two phrases for God's power and God's love and grace and mercy. The first thing we see about Daniel in uh, his um, prayer is that he showed determination. Determination, that's the key word in, in Daniel's prayer. Determination, that's the first thing. He said when he read Jeremiah and he saw that Jeremiah had written over a hundred years before, he had, he had not only preached and preached and preached to Israel to repent so God would have mercy, they wouldn't do it. So he said, all right, God's gonna let you go into captivity for 70 years. But after the 70 years, I'm gonna rebuild you, call you back, set you free, rebuild the temple, do all these wonderful things. So Daniel's reading the scripture, he says, well, it's almost that time. So it says he set his face, he set, he set his face to seek prayer and seek prayer to God. He set his face, he was determined. As Soon as he read it, he said, this is God's word. Jeremiah said it, they wrote it down. So we've had it all these years. Not, not too many people probably read it, but he was somehow in the word, reading the word. And when he did, and I know I can be sure that Daniel didn't just pray alone, but he had hundreds of other faithful ones like Ezra and Nehemiah, all those guys were prayer warriors. And he had many, probably Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, many folks were praying a very similar prayer 
to Daniel's prayer. So this was the pattern of prayer for the resolution of God's people back to the land. So his first thing was determination. Why? Because the devil throws everything against you when you want to pray and especially pray for something that is important, something specific. And we can pray for anything, everything, and the smallest things. Uh, God is not uh, touchy about what you ask for. You can ask for the tiniest details. He loves that. He's your gracious father. He loves every detail of your life. The hairs of your head are numbered. He sees a sparrow. You're worth many sparrows. All that tells you that God is interested in every detail of your life. And if you'll include him and talk to him about it and share with him uh, what's going on in your heart, he has opportunities to show you he's there, to show you he loves you, to show you that he cares. So we pray about many things, but there are some things that come up that are extremely important. They're, they're beyond all the details of life. That is, for instance, if somebody's very sick or someone's lost or addicted or, or there's a family problem or there's this, that financial problem, something serious, we want to be able to go to God and that the enemy will discourage us. So we need to be determined. Oftentimes the discouragement comes in the form of a question. God, why did you let this happen? God, why is this going on in my life? Why have I had to go through this? And that, that takes the edge off of our trust and faith to pray. Now it's okay to ask questions. Jesus said, why hast thou forsaken me? Nothing wrong with asking questions, but you don't get absorbed in the question and forget about the fact that God knows exactly what he's doing and get that back in your head that he's in control and he wants you to pray through this situation. Now, he may not answer you exactly the way you want. That's his business. He knows what's best, but he will answer. He will bless you. And if he doesn't change the system or the circumstances or the conditions, he will change your heart and he will strengthen and bless you. And it works out for the best, but never without prayer, serious prayer, prayers of faith, trusting that God loves you and he's gonna hear your prayers. So Daniel poured out his heart to God about something specific and he was determined. It reminds me of the blind men in Matthew, it says they saw Jesus and they didn't see him with their eyes, but they heard he was going by and they began to cry out. They began to cry out. In another case, the fellow was crying out to God and the people said, shush, 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 trying to shut him up. So he cried all the more. He was determined. He shouted Jesus finally to the two guys. He said, do you believe I can do this? And they said, Yes, yes, Lord. So he said, okay, it's done. And they could see. And, and God, Jesus did these unbelievable miracles like that. And, and he did them over and over. But when he did, oftentimes, it was a response to someone crying out to him. Reminds me of the Canaanite woman. Jesus was all over the Holy Land. And he went from where he was working around uh, Jerusalem and up in Galilee and over in Capernaum in that whole area. And he went all the way to the West Coast and to Tyre and Sidon, which traditionally were the enemies of God's work. Not so much the enemies of Israel, but full of idolatry. And he goes over and there, he's with his disciples. And he's probably trying to get some rest, probably trying to just get a break. And he's going and all of a sudden, somehow this Canaanite woman who traditional enemies of God and the, and, the, and the Jews, this Canaanite woman saw him and somehow she knew who he was. She recognized him and probably heard about him because his name was blazed abroad the whole, uh, all over the place. So she started to yell. <laughs> That's the first thing she did. She started to yell at him and she's yelling, my daughter, my daughter is under the affliction of a terrible demon. I want you to heal her, my daughter. And Jesus didn't answer her at first. He had a plan. He didn't answer her at first. So she's yelling and, and the disciples went to Jesus and pleaded with him. Literally, it says they pleaded with him and said, will you send her away? She just keeps yelling. 
Now, how do you like it when somebody yells? I don't like yelling. I go to a restaurant and everybody seems like they're yelling. Is it me? And, and, and I think, well, you know, just put the food in your mouth so you shut up so we can have some peace. But no, you know, it's, it's crazy. And, and of course, we all do that. And we get louder and louder. And, but how would you like it if you're walking down Elm Street and some person starts yelling at you? And they're following you yelling. <laughs> what would you, you, you'd say, what in the world? Well, this woman is following Jesus yelling. And the disciples are embarrassed, they're chagrined, they're upset. They say, will you send her away? And Jesus says, no. And he turns to her and, and, and says, what, what's going on? And she says, I want my daughter to be healed. Help me, help me, help me. It wasn't, very, it wasn't a very tidy situation. It was a little crazy. And so Jesus said to her, you know, he said, well, you shouldn't be taking the bread that's for the children and putting it under the table for the little, literally little puppies and dogs. And what, she, what he was saying was, I am sent to the house of Israel. I'm not sent yet to the Gentiles. That's going to be your job. It's for the disciples to go into all the world. I was sent specifically as a prophet, priest, king, Messiah of Israel. So he tests this woman and says, now, he says, I'm sent to Israel. And he says, uh, it's not right for me to take what God's given me and give it to others. And she says, yes, but the crumbs fall off the table and the little dogs get something. Oh, what a statement. He says to her, he says, woman, great is your faith. Great is your faith. It's done. Go home. Your wife, your daughter is totally healed. And it was so, so beautiful. But the persistence, the, the, the uh, determination uh, of this woman, that, that, that is, you know, we're not desperate enough. And I'll tell you what, if you get desperate enough, you'll pray. I remember one time um, when I, my first church, uh, I, we lived, I lived in this community where the church was, there was a lot of people there. And it was, in, it was near an area where they had all these fox hunters and all these millionaires, rich people. And, um, and uh, I heard that uh, the wife of one of the very successful horse trainers had been critically injured in a car accident. Now, I, I would visit anybody, and it was my hometown, so I would visit anybody whether they were from my church or not. So I heard that this lady was driving along, and as she was driving, a freak accident, a big limb came off a tree, went right through her windshield, and drove the steering wheel into her. And they took her to the hospital, and the doctor said to her husband, I don't think she's gonna make it. She says, there's nothing we can, we can just operate and do the best we can. So I didn't know any of this, I knew the accident happened. I, I was in the hospital, and I go down, and here he is sitting, this, uh, this horse trainer guy, big guy. Uh, I think it was an Irishman, and uh, he's sitting there all dejected, and, and nobody else around. And he's waiting because they're operating. So I went and I sat next to him and I introduced myself and he said, oh, thank you for coming. And, and I said, listen, uh, he says, they, they don't think there's much of a chance and I don't know what to do. And I said, well, we can pray. And he said, you know, how can I pray? I haven't prayed for years. I haven't prayed for years. See, he used to pray, maybe when he was a kid, maybe he was young, maybe he was committed at one time, but he hadn't prayed. He was successful. He didn't have time for God. He didn't need the Lord. All of a sudden, total disaster. So I said to him, I can pray <laughs> and I'll pray. And I sat with him until they brought her out of surgery and we prayed. And the doctor said, it's a miracle. She's okay. She's gonna be okay. Now here's the punchline. So the next day I go into her room and he's there with her. And he says to her, this is God, he's so good. He says to her, this is the preacher that prayed for you yesterday and, and had me praying. And she said, yeah, so. <laughs> and I thought, oh Lord have mercy on this woman. Well, you know what? She got out of the hospital, started coming to my church became a regular person in the church. What a, what a turnaround. But that was what God was after to start with. 
And he knows sometimes he can't reach people unless there's a crisis. So he reached them. She brought her mother. She, she, uh, the guy would come and, and it, it, it just God invaded that family. But he couldn't get their attention without some seeming disaster. But he not only that, he did a miracle. He, uh, well, I mean, you know, uh, it at least seems like a miracle because they didn't, more than the doctors expected. But the point is, if we keep close and pray, when the crisis comes, we're ready. And that's the way it was with Daniel. So Daniel not only was determined, but he was consistent. Daniel was consistent. You remember that all through his life, every day, Daniel would open the windows of his room and he would pray toward Jerusalem three times. Now, who knows what he prayed? He probably prayed for the king, he prayed for the people, prayed for the Jews, prayed for the family, prayed for God's purpose on the earth, all the things he knew to pray for until he finally saw this was a specific thing that God wanted to do now, and that is to answer this prayer and send the Jews back to Jerusalem. Up to that time, he was praying every day. In fact, one time when the, when the evil... Uh, the evil wise men who were jealous of him because uh, the king had Darius had put him at the top of the heap and these guys uh, calculated and figured out the only way we're going to get anything against this guy is for his religion so they 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 conned the king into saying nobody prays to anybody but me for 30 days or they go in the lion's den you remember the story and of course Daniel just kept right on praying and so into the lion's den he went and, and converted the king. <laughs> and, and the king prayed all night and fasted for him when he realized he'd done something stupid and, and had lied. And so Dave, Daniel prayed consistently. And that was his power to pray determinedly and to pray perseveringly, to persevere in prayer. His prayer life was consistent. No excuse for a real believer to stop praying or to neglect praying. The third thing about Daniel was, he was, and this is a big word, importunate. Not important, very important, but importunate. And what it means is he, he was persistent. It meant not only was he determined, and, and you know, you can be determined in your head and in your heart and not do anything about it. You can be determined and just say, well, I'm determined, I want this to happen and, and I'm gonna to try to do it. No, he, he turned the determination into persevering prayer and he prayed perseveringly and importun with importunity, which means he kept on. And of course, this is a, this is a pre-example of Jesus teaching about prayer. Remember this, the Lord never gets tired of our asking. And you say, well, I keep asking the same thing over and over. Don't stop. Keep asking. You say, how do you know? Well, Jesus told a story, which you know very well. I must have preached it 10 times. And, and that is the man who was at home in bed. Somebody knocks at the door. He's a fellow, a fellow of his, a friend of his. And he's at midnight, knocks at his door, says, I'm passing through and I need a place to stay. So the guy lets him in. He comes in and the guy's got nothing to feed him, which is a disgrace in those days. Uh, hospitality was a big deal. And, and uh, if you didn't have something to feed this, you know, and the guy was hungry, tired, weak, weary, and, and, and he needed food. So what did the guy do? Uh, he wouldn't go to the market, so he goes next door, starts beating on his neighbor's door. And the neighbor's in bed and he beats and beats. The neighbor finally says, go away, I'm in bed, my kids are in bed. And, and, and Jesus then stops the story. And says, you know what? He said the guy got up and gave him everything he wanted. Not because he was his friend, but because he wouldn't stop knocking. And then he says, so I say to you, ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking. And that's the Greek, knock and keep on knocking. So you got something you need from the Lord? Don't give up. Persevere, be importunate, keep praying, keep asking. And the beautiful thing is sort of a, a, a reverse analogy. The guy wouldn't get up and give this guy stuff because he was his friend. And then he says, how much more will your father in heaven give good things to them that ask him? And another scripture, give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him. And so perseverance is so important. Keep on asking. Just, and, and perseverance 
is the proof of determination. So if you're really determined, you're going to keep on knocking. Then, and this is the final point for today, humility. Daniel had tremendous humility. He was not proud. He had been exalted to the sky so many times, and yet he humbly went to God. He knew this, everything he had came from the Lord. He knew he was nothing. He knew he was nobody in himself. He knew that. And you know what? Jesus was the same way. Everything that he did with power and blessing, he deferred it to the Father. He said, the words I speak are not mine. They're from the Father. The works I do are not mine. They're from the Father. He kept deferring. He was like an empty vessel filled with God. And Daniel was close to that. And he never got proud, never got exalted, never got self-righteous. And in this chapter, he, he prayed, we have sinned. We have sinned. We have failed. We have disobeyed. We refuse to hear. The we's in this chapter, this prayer, are consistent. He just identifies himself, even though he was a holy guy, even though he risked his life for God time and again, even though he was a prayer warrior, he probably was as holy as anybody. Ezekiel sets him up as one of the three holiest men in history with a couple others in, in, in Ezekiel's writings. And, and God saw what he was, but he had this humility. What is the definition of humility? It's not saying that you are miserable, weak, and worthless. That's not true. You're supposed to have a sane evaluation of yourself. Not too big, not too little, not too great, not too small. But he said, humility, here's what it is. It is a full awareness of your utter and total dependency on the Lord. That's humility. I need him for everything. And the more I do that, the more he pours out his blessings. He says he resists the proud and gives abundant grace to the humble. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your great goodness to us. Lord, we thank you so much for the examples in your word of these men that you filled with your Holy Spirit and used mightily. Father, we want to be used. Lord, we want you to clear away our minds from all the cares and distractions of the world. God, I pray that you will raise up prayer warriors in this place for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. With the sound of the strings, cymbals and heart, we praise you. We praise you. With the timbrel and dance, and shouts to you, Lord, we praise you. We praise you. With new songs from our